Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. Um, in the previous session, uh, we had discussed uh, various uh, measures of risk and between the measures that the standard deviation and value at risk, we have discussed that uh, why value at risk is the most preferred uh, risk measure for the uh, regulators. Because regulators, they would like to because in order to ensure the sound health, uh, economics, financial health uh, in the economy, they would like to avoid a collapse of the, uh, that means the worst outcome they would like to avoid. So as a result, regulators, they will be preferring the measure of value at risk and accordingly, they will be advising the financial intermediaries, financial institutions to avoid uh, the worst uh, possible loss over a specific time horizon and uh, the ac accordingly the they will be getting the go ahead for the those investment decision there is no uh, worst possible loss actually so in this session we will see now we'll discuss what are the sources of risk then we also see what are the strategies to uh, minimize the risk so coming to the sources of risk uh, as you are aware that particularly for our uh, investment decision yeah, when it comes to debt uh, investment in bond you know that uh, interest risk is there similarly for uh, stocks there is stock price fluctuations are there so there are uh, lots of sources you, you can see the sources of there are different sources of risk and for the uh, discussion to put everything together let us see what are the major sources of risk that could arise so there are mainly two sources of risk one is called idiosyncratic risk and other one is uh, systematic risk so coming to the first one idiosyncratic risk means uh, it mostly a microeconomic and firm level risk so for example uh, again this can be classified it into two firm specific risk and sector specific risk so firm specific risk means for example take a particular firm for example maybe you can look at uh, Microsoft for example. So what is the firm specific risk this firm is facing? So maybe its own managerial and technical issues, technical uh, problems that the firm is facing, maybe the managerial some issues, uh, maybe because of that and maybe some issues with the, um, uh, the firm is facing with uh, its uh, raw material uh, or maybe say labor uh, labor market issues or something more specific to this firm itself so that is that are the firm specific risk uh, that is mostly with uh, that respective firm and little bit elaborating this one we can make into uh, sector specific risk for example take the example of change in the price of oil so what would happen if there is an increase in the price of oil and you know that when the price increase in the price of oil happen you know that auto sales fall and the automobile industry suffers right this is one so that is a shock a supply side shock in the form of uh, increase in the price of oil would affect the uh, automobile security price to decline right so that sector uh, will be getting affected worsely affected because of increase in price of oil so this is called a sector specific risk uh, this is also called as a uh, systemic risk as well however we know that this kind of risk also affect in one way one sector it affects badly but the other sector for example when the higher oil prices improve the profits of energy firms including shell and texaco right so that means an oil price change that is bad for automobile firm and is good for the oil company. So looking at the economy from an economic perspective, you can see that this is an idiosyncratic risk that is affecting some particular sectors of the economy. Then moving to another risk that is called uh, systematic risk. This is at the macroeconomic level, at the aggregate level, that means economy as a whole. So this means this is the, these are the risks that everyone will do poorly at the same time. So the examples for this kind of risk includes uh, macroeconomic factors such as swings in consumer and business confidence uh, brought on by global economic conditions or changes in political climate are the sources 
of systematic risk that affect all firms and individuals in the economy and the reason one is the covid is another risk that you know that uh, it was a uh, it's actually in fact a systematic risk and you know that uh, initially started the because of the covid and it affected both supply side and demand side of the economy and it became uh, the problem the global recession uh, it actually aggravated and actually there was negative economic growth in most economies across the globe right now let us see discuss what are the measures to reduce the risk so overall it has been advised that uh, one of the major approach of reducing risk is through diversification that means the principle of holding more than one risk at a time that means a combination of risky investment is often less risky than any one individual investment and this part is very important that the reducing risk through diversification uh, especially policy makers uh, especially regulators and government they often encourage pension funds to diversify to reduce the investment risk you know that for example the pension fund where the employees they contribute to the pension fund during their working uh, years and they expect a lump sum amount at the time of retirement and also they expect a stream of um, stream of uh, pension income for income uh, after their retirement so in that way you know that there's a kind of safety say stability or security so actually these funds were which they contributed in their working years actually this is called the pension funds uh, they earn pension funds earn uh, their income uh, in invest in, in investing in bond market and equity market equity market etc right so that means then within that actually what uh, regulators would say that within bond itself they will be making uh, advising them to make investment in a way that uh, high quality that a triple a and actually a stream, a stream because you know that higher the quality of the bond you know that they will be getting low interest rate uh, in triple a ratings and if they invest in junk uh, you know that they will be getting a uh, high interest rate but there is the default risk is very high and equity you know that is very a uh, very fluctuating market uh, however as compared, compared to bond market over time if you look at the equity market you can see that return from uh, equity market is uh, slightly higher than the bond market so in this way uh, in order to avoid so this one avoid the risk the investment risk uh, government normally especially the pension funds they are they, they uh, invest diversified uh, their investment they won't invest all their fund in either in equity or in bond or even within bond they will be making diversification within equity they will be making diversification so this is actually one strategy uh, one overall strategy of reducing uh, risk uh, that is through stratification uh, diversification uh, there are two ways to diversify the risk one is called hedging risk so hedging risk is the strategy of reducing idiosyncratic risk by making two investments with opposing risk so let us elaborate ex uh, discuss, uh, discuss this concept by using an example suppose you are buying any or an investment fund is buying 100 stocks from both firms with the opposing risk so opposing risk that for example we have seen that when there is an increase in oil price increase in the prices of oil uh, you can see that uh, some sectors benefit for example the firms who the energy producing firm energy companies uh, they benefit their stock price increase uh, when there is increase in oil price right at the same time you know that automobiles their price their stock price will decline or uh, because of increase in oil price because that the cost of production increase and not only that cost of production increase actually the cost of operating even the people won't be buying the demand for uh, automobile will uh, decline when there is an increase in uh, petrol price and as a result their sale will decline and the um, uh, stock price will also decline so look at these two examples to, to opposing firms the both firms with opposing risk let us take a uh, oil company for example assuming that uh, investment is made only two firms with opposing risk and to happen the probability of uh, rising oil uh, is 
uh, 50 percent and the uh, for probability of falling price uh, we take the value of uh, 50 percent 0.5 and 0.5. Suppose uh, what would happen if there is a rise in uh, oil price uh, you know that oil producing companies their um, their income will increase dividend will increase uh, their share price will increase. So someone investing uh, $100 because of increase in the price of oil uh, you can see that uh, the price of stock is going to become 120. What if the other way around? Suppose there is fall in price. So what would happen to the stock of this oil company? You can see that uh, this will be coming down to uh, $90, right? So that is they are going to make a loss of this much. And what if there is uh, a rise in oil price? What would happen to the automobile firm? We know that automobile firm uh, their sales will decline and their stock price will uh, decline. So that means uh, they will make a loss after the investment uh, 100, uh, maybe after one day, after that oil price rise, uh, it will become only 90. And at the same time, suppose there is fall in oil price, uh, then you can see that the stock price will be uh, increasing. So what you can see, suppose either of these things will happen, right? Either rise in oil price or uh, rise in oil price or fall in oil price. If rise in oil price happen, you know that if a, a stock, uh, you had invested $100 in oil company and $100 in uh, automobile firm, you know that from oil company you will be benefiting, but here you will be losing. Similarly, if fall in price, you can see that you will be benefiting from automobile firm stock, uh, that here you will be benefiting, here uh, you will be making slight loss. But overall, you know, you know that uh, because of this, uh, if suppose a rise in oil price happen, the loss in one that the oil company uh, stock, uh, it will be compensated from the gain from the investment in oil, sorry, the loss from automobile company stock, uh, investment in auto company stock, automobile company stock uh, will be compensated by the gain in stock uh, from oil company. Similarly, you can see with the fall in prices. So overall, what we have seen here is that the loss from uh, one investment uh, is being compensated from the gain from uh, another investment. So this is called a kind of st a strategy called hedging a risk. Then another risk is called uh, spreading uh, risk. Spreading risk means not with a, not making investment in uh, opposing firms, uh, firms with the opposing risk. Instead, uh, making investment, really making true diversification uh, of making, for example, uh, make investment in bond market, uh, equity market. Uh, uh, within bond market, uh, invest in, for example, uh, government bonds uh, and private firm, suppose corporate bond if you are investing, um, corporate firm if you are investing, make two unrelated firm. For example, you know that uh, automobile, automobile and firm, uh, instead of uh, opposing risk oil firm, uh, let us see software industry, uh, software industry, uh, then banking industry, Th th those are seemingly unrelated. Uh, sectors like that. That means government, corporate, uh, that means even within corporate making uh, different types or uh, different sectors which are not uh, not having opposing risk. Similarly, government also you take uh, central government, uh, state government, uh, state government here long term, short term like that, long term, uh, short term. So in this way, similarly equity also you make investment in firms that are uh, seemingly unrelated firms. So that means uh, because through that uh, we can uh, spread the risk and we can reduce spread the risk in this way through the uh, proper diversification. So what we have covered here so far, uh, we have discussed the concept of risk, uh, its measurement, then we discussed the why value at risk is uh, an important concept uh, in the uh, financial sector, especially in the context of regulation. And subsequently, we had discussed the sources of risk that is idiosyncratic or systemic and uh, other one is systematic risk. Then subsequently, we discussed uh, the methods for uh, reducing risk through diversification where hedging and spreading uh, two are the two strategies of reducing uh, the, for the uh, diversification. Uh, Let us now move uh, to another related area, maybe overall is a continuation of what we have been doing. 
uh, is more of an economic analysis of financial regulation. So, why? Importantly, we will be seeing that what are the rational behind uh, economic financial regulation. So, we have seen in one of the previous session that financial sector is the one of the uh, heavily regulated sectors in economy uh, is, is a fact throughout the uh, across the globe across the globe you can see that financial sector is the most heavily uh, regulated sector here we see that uh, why it makes for, uh, see a reason with the why identify the reason for and forms of a government security net in financial market and subsequently we see that how government safety net itself has been contributing to uh, making the financial uh, crisis or the collapse of the financial system uh, or affecting the health of the financial system. Uh, what we are going to see that one in one way we are going to see that a uh, government safety net is important in financial market because ensuring a sound financial system is for that the is it is very very much necessary for ensuring a sound economic system as well. But at the same time we are going to see that how a government safety net itself is going to uh, reduce the efficiency of a financial system. Uh, that is what that is the one and subsequently we will list, uh, list and summarize the types of financial regulation and how it reduce and aggravates both actually reduces and at the same time aggravates asymmetric problem in the financial market. So, let us begin uh, one by one. So, first one uh, we have already seen in the previous sessions that the asymmetric information problem. So, that is the one of the reason that means one of the rationale for financial regulation uh, was asymmetric information. Uh, let us see now how uh, sometime asymmetric information uh, that asymmetric information is uh, necessitating uh, the government intervention and then we are going to see immediately after that we are going to see how such a government inter intervention it has been doing good but at the same time it also aggravates the problem instead of reducing this problem and some of the government interventions uh, it aggravates the problem. So, let us start with the case of bank uh, because as we have seen that bank is an important a key uh, financial intermediary uh, in the overall financial system. So, coming to the asymmetric information uh, in the banking system, we can see that uh, bank themselves, uh, they the financial intermediary bank as a financial intermediary, uh, they are having uh, better information. Uh, they, they, they have because of their managerial and technical expertise and since because they have uh, lots of customers with them who is doing financial transactions and because of that we have already seen that banks are having um, a comparative advantage, banks are having comparative advantage in the financial market uh, in forms in the form of collection of private information. And we have also seen that banks are good in that because they do not need to worry moreover they do not need to worry about free rider problem. Free rider problem is not in the banking system uh, because you know that uh, banks when they collect information when they produce information they are not sharing this information with the anyone they are inf instead they are benefiting out of their private information collection because they make uh, private loans right that is what we have seen uh, in one of the previous sessions. So, they make uh, private loans in that way banks are um, able to reduce the free rider problem. This is all fine this is about from the perspective of banking system for, for the banks is fine because banks are able to reduce uh, their expertise in collection of information. Then how about depositors? And you know that bank, what the bank do, bank, a bank does, what the bank does, you know that it collect uh, deposits, uh, deposits from uh, uh, the public uh, and it uh, make uh, loans, right. So, it makes loans, loans means these are the uh, assets of the banks. So, we have seen that these are the assets. So, banks normally operate that they borrow short, that is borrow short from here, that is borrow short. Um, and lends uh, long term that is what the asset transformation uh, normally bank and get, get engaged in. So, in this process the assets quality 
because depositors they deposit their money in the bank and they get a uh, agreed rate of interest maybe for example 5 percent they get it you know that banks by collecting deposit from uh, multiple investors various investors various depositors uh, then you know that they will they'll be lending this money to the uh, loan market right so here uh, depositors each and every depositor they they cannot know uh, they don't know the quality of these assets what are the quality of these assets uh, is not measurable is not uh, there is asymmetric information with regard to the quality of the loans the quality of the assets the banks have acquired so that means they cannot distinguish suppose the money i have invested in my bank uh, i don't know whether the quality of the asset that they have acquired using this money what is their quality good quality or low quality i have no idea that is one suppose this we take bank one then take another bank two bank two uh, they also will be obviously they also working on the same way that a deposit and loan uh, they you know that they will be doing that however again for the general public uh, because we don't know the quality of the assets of bank 1 and the quality of the assets of bank 2 and then the what we can say that which bank is good and which bank is bad suppose those banks which acquire very uh, low quality assets that the loans with the high default risk then obviously we are, we can see that uh, the probability of defaulting or the bank the probability of not uh, unable to refund the deposit it will be very high with those bank uh, who is having low quality assets right so that means uh, important thing that we need to remember here that about the depositors they are having asymmetric information about the quality of the assets each banks are holding plus they cannot uh, distinguish which bank is good bank and which bank is bad bank so then suppose uh, a news spread out a rumor is spreading out that actually uh, one bank uh, one bank is unable to or maybe we observe that in the newspaper that one bank is unable to pay back the depositors money and suppose that is one another thing is that uh, also news spread that actually there are many banks at risk uh, they may not be able to uh, they are at a risk and many banks the non performing assets of many uh, many banks are having non performing assets and if all depositors go to their bank they won't be able to uh, refund uh, pay back uh, their deposit so in this case suppose we are getting this news that ap approximately 5 percentage suppose we say that 5 percent of the banks are bad banks in the economy sometime this news comes or already we know that some banks obviously there there will be bad banks with a poor quality uh, suppose the the new news is in a way that uh, five percent of the banks are bad banks so depositors cannot clearly identify which bank is this which bank belongs to this five percentage whether the investment made by me uh, whether i have my bank uh, belongs to this five percentage or any other banks right in this case what is going to happen that a kind of bank panics develop bank panics develop here means that banks as banks operate on a sequential service constraint that means sequential service constraint means a first come first served basis so in this way when a bank works uh, depositors have a very strong incentive to be the first to show up at the bank you know that that means uh, the incentive to run to the bank to be first is why withdrawals when there is fear about the health of the bank is described as a bank run that means if this rumor is uh, coming uh, spreading out or all day news is coming out that some banks are uh, unable to pay back uh, the depositors money in that way what will happen that the bank panics uh, spread uh, the depositors will be running to the bank to do withdraw their uh, deposit as early as possible at the earliest so this is leading to bank run you know what happened if the bank run uh, continues like that so you know that if everyone is doing like that because already in each and every bank that means bank we know, we know that clearly bank the deposit um, looking at this point a deposit and loan we see that deposit is the most liquid item right deposit is most liquid uh, we can withdraw uh, deposit at any time but loans are illiquid not uh, liquid as uh, deposits 
because you know that these are the illiquid because loan agreements uh, may are made for one year uh, five years 10 years 20 years 30 years uh, so like that then you know that this money whichever is collected from the general public is already uh, uh, given as loans it cannot be called call back immediately it's very difficult to call back uh, the loan amount right because it's not that easy so because of that uh, we can see that these are illiquid so because of the because of this uh, fear uh, you know that the bank panic uh, people all will be approaching the bank running to the bank so there won't be enough money you know there will be some uh, wall cash and there will be some reserve with the central bank and there will be some loans will be coming back uh, so that's all right so that means if uh, you can see that you can really see that it's a kind of contagion effect that means uncertainty about the health of the banking system in general can lead to runs on both good and bad banks because start initially the problem will be with the bad banks but from the depositors perspective they don't know clearly how to distinguish the good bank and bad banks the moment they come to know that some banks are not giving back their deposit the people will start running to the good bank as well so when they are running to the good bank you know that this bank already given loan to all the uh, in a very short long term uh, they are actually all their asset qualities are fine the default risk is suppose uh, they have given all their loans to uh, low risk customers and there is very guaranteed that they will be paying back but the thing is that if all the customers directly uh, they make a bank run uh, if they all approach the bank for withdrawing their deposit then a good bank a good bank also won't be able to uh, repay the deposit so then the good bank is going to become a bad bank right because they won't be able to pay back the deposit that means failure of one bank can hazen the failure of others this is called contagion effect so that means uh, this contagion effect is more prevalent more strong in the banking system even if uh, one bank is uh, because of maybe their own idiosyncratic risk or systemic risk they fail and that is actually going to affect not only the bad bank or the other banks who have been doing well and they may not be able to pay back all the deposit uh, if everyone run to the bank because the money is already invested for long term right so if nothing is done to restore public confidence a bank panic can ensue and what we can see that at the end uh, the entire banking system is going to collapse right because um, the entire banking system is going to collapse because of this contagion uh, effects so in this case also if the um, some bank for example a good bank uh, suppose many uh, customers are coming to uh, coming to the counter to withdraw their uh, deposit then what they will be doing they will be making a distress sellings of their assets maybe the loans that they are having uh, all the loans they will be making resale uh, reselling uh, resale of their loans because they need to pay back to the deposit uh, pay back the deposit of the uh, deposit is so if in a as a distress selling of assets bank will be do for example they will be doing the resale of their asset then you know that if they are making a distress sell they will be making lots of loss actually even you know that there will be excess supply of assets in the market especially during financial crisis time uh, this kind of distress sale happen but you know that there is excess sale of assets then actually the price will come down then they will be making a uh, huge loss so what we have seen here is that uh, one of the thing we have discussed that the um, government say with that because of the asymmetric problem that is not only with the uh, banking system the entire financial system but more specifically with the depositors uh, the between depositors and the bank it can also aggravate uh, asymmetric problem and lead to the market failure that the collapse of the banking system can uh, happen we will uh, uh, conclude this uh, session now and in the next session we will continue this discussion what are the response of government in order to overcome this bank panics in order to uh, avoid the adverse effects of this bank panics what are the solutions uh, proposed by uh, or implemented by governments across the globe and then we will see what are the uh, further likely effect thank you see you in the next session